It's time to start. Before we start with the keynote lectures, uh, we have one an announcement. The announcement is that the farewell will not be tomorrow uh, in this venue, but to spare time for those who are traveling fast, we decided to organize farewell uh, at the venue of large group. So the bus will wait for you later to return here, but just not to go tomorrow after the large group and stay for well, farewell there. This is the announcement. Also to remind you that during the lunch break, there will be Egatin Agora in art gallery. Uh, now I, I am, um, it's my pleasure and honor uh, to chair this session, my dear colleagues Jelica Sataric, Snežana Kecović Miljević and Danilo Pešić will have their lectures and uh, actually it will be three lectures so I ask you for, for patience uh, with the, we were thinking how to organize it and it will be organized at the end the questions and answers will be uh, given. We uh, were thinking just that we, you, ha you will have uh, three aspects of future working on future in group analysis what is the title of this presentation and in uh, making good atmosphere and or something encouraging atmosphere we divided them like Yelitsa Satrich will talk in philosophical way Danilo will talk in scientific Snežana will talk in experiential and emotional way. This was just rough, actually, rough division and connection. Now, Jelica Sataric, who is a psychiatrist, a, a training group analyst, and uh, chair president of our society, Group Analytic Society Belgrade. Jelica worked for a long time with addicts, so her experience is precious and also is a person uh, among us who is very thoughtful and also very knowledgeable about law. So I invite Jelica to give her lecture. Uh, thank you, Tia, and thank you, all of you, and thank you, uh, colleagues who are online. Um, uh, working on the future of group analysis. Uh, okay, 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 and now? It is okay now? Okay. Uh, future and the freedom. Our world is uh, changing faster than ever, than uh, ever before. The changes are so deep that it seems like nothing can remain the same. The matrix of, huma is of humanity is boiling over. Uh, there, uh, there is a prevailing ses sense of uncertainty. Apocalyptic threats dominate the media, the public gatherings. However, the, uh, the uncertainty, which I also feel myself, seems not to be generated by, the, by uh, human freedom in general, but by the 
an awareness, uh, namely lack of transparency of the plans, uh, interests uh, and negotiations of uh, various very power groups. We can only hope that the mighty keep at least so much rationality not to destroy the world in their conflicts. Uh, still, I cannot consider uh, this uh, main source of hope for the future. I associate hope with freedom and I will not give it up in spite of the impression that human freedom as a factor of change does not seem to be uh, counted on uh, at a global scale anymore. If I were to think about freedom from a group analytic perspective, I could say that it is a property of our social nature. And as Hannah Arendt writes, um, the philosophical tradition has distorted, instead of clarifying the very idea of freedom, such as, uh, such as it given in human experience by transporting it from its original field, the realm of politics and human affairs in general, to an inward domain. Uh, the individualistic approach, which sees the individual as independent and isolated, defines freedom as limited by the very fact that we are living in a society. From the point of view of the basic, uh, from point of view of the basic sociability of humans, it may be said that freedom is not limited, but rather intertwined, just like our lives. Um, after all, the personal experience of limitations depends on the context and the emotional connections with others. The limitations of freedom in the sense of the term are something else. Uh, they are woven into divisions which reflect power, rela power relations. However, it uh, may not to be strong to say that no power can control and rule human freedom unless people ultimately give, it, give up on it, whether consciously or unconsciously, and the temptations have been great, Faustian, since forever. The power of freedom may be described by the inspired words of uh, Bertrand Russell on free thought. Uh, thought is subversive and uh, revolutionary, is merciless to privilege, established institution, uh, institutions and comfortable habits, is indifferent to authority. Uh, Thought looks into the pit of hell and is not afraid. Thought is great and swift and free, and the chief glory of man. Um, even if we were to reduce the intensity of this statement, the message about the impact of free thought would still remain clear. Therefore, the impression that freedom is always dangerous for social structures of power that strive for, for predictability holds true. Uh, these structures are in a way necessary and might even reflect the human need for control of the internal and external worlds. However, they have alienated themselves from a more complex need for a balance of control and freedom and are be, uh, becoming an entity that independently designs that balance in line with, it, uh, with its own interests. Uh, with these even two intense feelings about the, these joint thoughts on the future, I was looking for an anchor. By chance, I found it in the words of Jacques Derrida. In general, I try and distinguish between what one calls uh, the future and l'avenir. Uh, l'avenir means uh, future and avenir means uh, to come. The future is that uh, which 
tomorrow, later, next century will be. There is a future which is predictable, programmed, scheduled, foreseeable. But there is a future, l'avenir, to come, which refers to someone who comes, whose arrival is totally unexpected. That which is totally unpredictable. The other who comes without my being able to anticipate the arrival. So, if there is a real future beyond the other non-future, it is l'avenir in that it is coming of the other when I am completely unable to foresee the, their arrival. Both futures, uh, the predictable and unpredictable, are of existential importance. Our relationships, uh, relationship towards the two is unavoidably marked by responsibility. Predictable is that uh, which uh, science is general accepts as such. Uh, the principle of causality states that all phenomena have their cause. This cause is rarely simply and clear and is usually complex. In the first inst instance, the effect of the cause is predictable and certain. In the other case, the result of interaction of numerous factors cannot be predicted. It is only possible to define the probability of the potential outcomes. The main goal, however, remains to discover hidden variables, as Einstein said, which will reveal the causal connection connections that had before not been understood. The guest for predictability and certainty is not given up on. This trend of thinking is also transferred to psychology and social sciences. However, the attempts to achieve a deterministic guidance of human choices and decisions still remain unsuccessful. For Hannah Arendt, Though freedom in its core does not mean freedom of choice or freedom or even freedom of will. Rather, it is the capacity to start something new, to do unexpected, to call something into being which didn't exist before, which was not given not even, not even as an object of cognition or imagination. Human nature and restrained freedom. Many disciplines dealing with the understanding of, human, of humans I, are trying to describe certain properties of human beings, mostly the mind, ethics, and freedom. <clears throat> Group analysis brings about a revolutionary twist to the individualistic approach through the idea of human nature as basically social. Fuchs writes, personally, I believe that the multipersonal hypothesis of mind is nearer to the, is nearer to the true nature of events. And I believe, however, that there is a quite specific resistance against accepting mental processes as multipersonal phenomena. Perhaps there is a similar resistance to the idea of the social natures of ethics and uh, freedom. <clears throat> when, writing, when writing about had inspired him to dedicate himself to group analysis, Fuchs also mentioned Bertolt Brecht and the way he staged his plays by allowing the actors to step out from their roles and personally address the audience. The particular purpose of this technique is to encourage in the audience the conviction that one need not necessarily act in a certain way. One can also step out or one's determining factors and decide to react and act differently. This freedom of choice, this responsibility, 
this release from fatalism impressed me. The psychoanalytical concept of the dynamic unconscious demonstrated how and why people sometimes choose ignorance without suspecting that this could lead to fatalism. The concept of the social unconscious exhibit, uh, exhibits a form of enduring consistency in preserving the structure of social relations and the psychological structures of individuals. The concept of so social unconscious refers to existence and constraints of social, cultural, communicational, and technological arrangements of which people are unaware. Unaware in so far these arrangements are not perceived, not known, and if perceived, not acknowledged, denied, and if acknowledged, not taken as a problematic given, and if taken as a problematic, not considered with an optimal degree of detachment and objectivity, as said Hopper. It should be underlined that the notion of constraint does not mean only restraint, but also the facilitation of feelings and Im imagination. Perhaps the aspect of restraint, uh, of restraint is highlighted more than facilitation, which may give an, in an incomplete picture of the reflecting of social unconsciousness in group processes. An example of facilitation influence may be found in the paper Nikola Tesla and Social Unconscious of Serbs. Um, analysis, some, uh, analysis, some critic may say, slips into the unconscious causality, which is not totally unfounded. My impression um, uh, is uh, that uh, uh, in today's practice is not predominant, at least on a conscious level. However, consciously it may happen that we find it hard to resist the challenge of the hidden cause, especially in therapy. A more or less influential medical model leads us into temptation to discover the unconscious source of suffering and thus help the patients. It is also a minor temptation in training, especially in supervision, uh, uh, when the supervisor and trainees are under the influence of the classical learning model according to which the knowledge which is conveyed uh, uh, is expected to explain and predict of, uh, the further course of events. Um, the theory of group analysis and the application. The group analysis paradigm is constantly evolving and currently may be explained in short with Hopper words as a general approach to the study of social and conscious processes and theoretical and practical attempts to integrate sociology, psychoanalysis and the study of group dynamics within group analysis. I fully agree with him when he says that this approach or model has in so many ways only just began to bear fruit. In practice, this approach is reflected among other things in the complementing of, inter of interpretations with social context. The concept of a tripartite matrix offers a, co offers a compre comprehensive overview of group dynamics. Events and processes in the foundation matrix of contextual society tend to be recapitulated in the dynamic matrix of the group and in personal matrices of the members of it and to some degree vice versa. This is a kind of mirroring the equivalence of processes and events from one submatrix to the other submatrices. This phenomenon of equivalence is important for practice. Freedom and unpredictable in group analysis. In the, constant, in the context of this paper, unpredictable and freedom have the main, uh, meaning of mutually connected properties of human nature. Uh, what is unpredictable is not something that is impossible. It is not a mir miracle. It is not some other world uh, that is falling down us, but something human that is living here and now in every one of our meetings. Can we ever be ready for the challenges that uh, will happen during this, that encounter to be feeling that the 
fateful order is random or irrelevant, that something unimportant became important, that uh, closeness is full of uncertainty, that uncertainty is, is only temporary. The key terms here are those of uh, co-creation, emergence, and unpre unpredictability. What we are faced with here is a kind of radical uncertainty, a proud, profound uncertainty that will not be tamed by rationality of uh, any other means uh, rights allow. Uh, uh, learning from, from practice. A small analytic group with its setting and its culture is a welcoming place for the unpredictable other. Uh, it sometimes uh, happens that uh, a group member in a group whose members have known each other for a while shares their, uh, their observation of thinking somehow simply addressing the group. The other side are taking aback as this is not as this is not what they were expecting. This individual becomes somehow different, almost unknown. Their words are deep and wise. There is a new sense of respect for him, her, as if he, she is, is, uh, is in that moment becoming the other, though someone who is not other familiar or predictable to the extent that they are almost con unconsciously perceived as an it. Uh, these new ideas are shared by uh, all members. They become the group's. Uh, they become the group's property. This gives a strong impetus to the group as a new vit vitality is felt. My impression is that it the, that uh, it is happening furthermore then there is a realism of need or a deep desire to address others, to say something to the group, uh, to give them something and share something with them, as if there is a direct manifestation of that uh, which Fuchs expressed with his attitude that the need for communication creates the mind. I think that uh, the real nature of mind lies in each individual's need for communication and reception. Derrida invades, uh, in a way shares these ideas, taught in so far as it is, to, as it is uh, to be for men, cannot take place without philia, translated into the language of a human and finite cogito. This gives the formula, I think, therefore I am the other, I think, therefore I need the other in order to think, I think, therefore the possibility of friendship is lodged in the movement of my thought in so far as demands, calls for, desires the other. This experience changes the relationship within the group, changes uh, uh, conscious and unconscious divisions and, pa and power dynamics. Some without a formal education become sharp and wise, someone uh, who is afraid and vague shows deep, someone un unattractive became attractive. Uh, some other things, honestly respect, sharing, compassion, spontaneously became more important than eloquence or social position, position background. Others are not taken for granted as they carry unexpected words within. A special emotional capacity is developed to trust the other member, even though it is uncertain that uh, uh, what person may be like from tomorrow. The ideal relationships are mutually developed, which are ethical in this essence, and in this, and it, it, it is in these ethical relations that trust is created. It is on the trust and not on certainty that the feeling of safety in group is based. Something similar is happening also in the supervisory group when someone um, uh, shares the new view of the group which is shown, uh, uh, it is as if, as if it becomes clear that the group is not only what it seems to be or that which could be said about it through the analysis of unconscious processes. Regardless the, of the usefulness of knowledge of these processes, we should never allow this to be the horizon of the group. The optimistic and ethical scenario may be ascribed to a special purpose of the therapeutic group, which is to help people with their uh, psychological issues. The members see the group as the place where suffering is talked about. 
people uh, in the group are more, are more attentive, uh, they try to have compassion and understand the other. However, it could also be the case that the group is seen as a more realistic display of life in which every individual individually suffers without to uh, talking about this sense, such behavior is often understood as a sign of weakness. The non-therapeutic application of group analysis approach to different forms of group uncovers the same that we see in the therapy group, the need for communication and sharing, mutual respect and empathy. In this context, I wish to refer to the reflexive citizen method, which aims to spread the love and uh, for love for, for togetherness through dialogue and zajedničarenje. This method uh, was developing for 12 years by Marina Mojovic and me and spreads now not only uh, in Serbia but in other countries. When in a group the uh, experience of equality and mutual understanding and compassion is attained, that experience it seems to me is never complete or total, uh, not, uh, not until the end. I would share here briefly my association and consideration about Derrida Avenir. Uh, the arrival of the other is uh, always shifted to, is shifted to the future, but the, uh, the arrival itself is, is unpredictable. However, however, we often have the idea that the arrival would mean a complete arrival in its full extent to the end, but that which is in the arrival already exists here, although incomplete. It is something that is still not, something marked with the incompleteness, which uh, that missing part, in fact, may represent its essence. Its essence. This uh, incompleteness is actually the source of the driving force in the present which is designed to fill in these gaps. We often feel unconsciously that something is not the real thing if it, if it has flaws. This leads to denial of such flaws in everything that we find important. It seems that the idea of experience of real thing is deeply rooted. Real therapy, uh, real equality, real justice, real democracy. Facing with the incompleteness is painful and in running away from what the pain we may be running away from ourselves somehow. Uh, in the sense, the group as the meeting of divided worlds is always an experience that is to come, a veneer, which is present, but never until the end. Uh, as the group uh, uh, analysts with our knowledge and our feelings, with our heart, we participate. Uh, we participate uh, with group members in the experience of the shifting of boundaries through fear and pain, support and understanding, through trust toward the unpredictable. Groups are so brave, uh, the group becomes uh, open for the unpredictability of the members and itself as a whole without being aware of, it, of that. That is, is one of the main sources of the vitality of group analysis. Uh, one example, the session started more or less typically. The group members were dealing with life events of some of them through comments and by sharing their feelings and associations. There was a looming, um, uh, in a moment, the opinions were very opposing. There was a looming sense that an argument would break out. However, it did not almost as it, it was a tacit, tacit uh, 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 agreement. They continued to talk about different topics. After a while, I was on the impression that something was changing. Each topic served as basis for everyone to share their own reactions, habits, or feelings. There was nothing especially new for the group there. Everyone's talking calmly and uh, freely about things uh, that, that he'd been uncomfortable taking about before. Everyone was fully present. The voices became calm, soft, everything resembled the harmonious composition. There was peace and simplicity in the group. They talked about differences as they were telling a common story. At the end, all of the members had 
impressions that there was a great session. Uh, it is difficult to describe such experience. Uh, um, it is as if the members differentiated themselves through these differences, each one individually, and connected at the same time from mutual responsiveness. What was it gave the group uh, this sense of uh, tranquility and simplicity, this special balance of detachment and intimacy? In a moment, it seemed like an aesthetic aspect of experience or a form of harmony that connects and suits. Uh, I thought, of course, that this could be a great group defense from a conflict uh, within the group of resistance to mutual involvement. But it may also be understood as an unconscious creative response of the group to some processes that interfere with free communication. Uh, and again, it was maybe discovered how the need for communication creates something new. Of course, with an emphasis on the maybe. Uh, uh, okay, this is uh, uh, okay. Maybe for the end, some some uh, poet poetry uh, beyond the horizon, across the divide, round about midnight, will be on the same side beyond the horizon in the springtime or fall love waits forever for one and for all bob dylan thank you yalita we would have many thoughts and discussions, but we, I, I owe you just that I didn't say the one more thing that Yelica likes is rock music. And uh, now uh, I, I'm announcing Danilo Pesic. Uh, he's a psychiatrist, group analyst, and uh, uh, in training of psychoanalysis, PhD candidate, and uh, He's also somebody who is very curious about these many fields he is in, and also very helping uh, colleagues and our training because, uh, through the connection of Institute uh, of Mental Health and our society. So I announce Danilo Pesic. At the beginning, I would like to say that this is a truly an honor and privilege for me to speak in this symposium along my dear colleagues. Today, I will discuss the simpler aspect of our topics, specifically the research challenges and the potential connection of group analysis with potential with uh, uh, progress in neurosciences. I will begin by discussing research in the field of group therapy in general. Extensive research on group therapy outcomes, especially in America, undeniably confirm the effectiveness of group therapy across a wide range of clinical population and setting, from treating chronic pain to working with prisoners and veterans. The result of several hundred studies and numerous meta-analyses demonstrate outcomes equivalent to those of individual psychotherapy, strongly supporting the use of group therapy and likely contributed to the recognition of group psychology and group psychotherapy as a specialization by the American Psychological Association in 2018. If we turn our attention back to Europe, where group analytic psychotherapy is likely the most frequently employed psychodynamic group therapy, we observe that the situation is entirely distinct. In the introductory section of the special issue of group analysis from 1992, which centers on research, Kenner and Winter state, for most of us, doing research may be a rather distant goal. Why is the case when Fuchs, similar to Freud, support research? Fuchs said, this concomitance of treatment and research is now a common place in medicine and is largely responsible for advances in the field of therapy. Maybe we can explain the difference by ideology of American pragmatism. Pragma in Greek means that which has been done. The philosophy of pragmatism emerged in the United States through the work of Pierce, James and Dewey, significantly impacting the scientific field. 
In the spirit of pragmatism, emphasize empirical research, champion experimentation, strive for efficient and pragmatic resolution, demand immediate applicability and ensure concrete utility and you will receive funding for the research and the therapy will be supported by health insurance. But the situation in group analysis is completely different. The, uh, to the best of my knowledge, today we have only one literature review from 2006 and only one systematic review from 2012. Uh, the review was conducted by Sterner Lorentzen, Norwegian gentleman, uh, with, the good me uh, with the gold medal for the number of randomized control, control trials in group analytic therapy. A systematic review was conducted by Blackmore and colleague from the, uh, at the University of Sheffield. Lorentzen found about 15 studies that examined the outcome of treatment. However, for most of studies, it's difficult to determine whether it's group analysis or for another dynamic therapy in a group. Blackmore and colleagues study examined the outcome of group analytic therapy and dynamic group therapy. The review covered about 20 studies, but it should be emphasized that only uh, uh, less than a third of the include studies are group analytic studies. The authors themselves highlighted the quality of the studies is questionable, but the result exists. In the context of outcome studies, uh, uh, randomized controlled uh, trials appeared later, seemingly waiting for Stena Lorentzen to introduce his short-term group analytic therapy. Short-term therapy is presented through a therapeutic guide and take place in a closed small analytic group once a week. Distinct from a group analytic therapy, this approach is notably brief, spanning a total of 20 sessions. Moreover, it prioritizes a thorough assessment on individual personality organization because those with a low level of personality organization are deemed unsuitable for treatment. Um, the therapist takes a more active role, encouraging early group interactions and cohesion. Considering the above, we could say that short-term group analytic therapy looks like a more proactive, younger sibling of group analytic therapy. The first published study compares the result of short therapy lasting for six months and group analytic therapy, long therapy, which lasts for two years. After the completion of both shorter and longer therapies, a follow-up and assessment is conducted at the third and seventh year. This is very important. During the third year follow-up assessment, both groups and short and long therapies demonstrate the similar outcomes. Over time, as expected, patients in group analytic uh, psychotherapy experience changes notably, but significant changes appear to be more pronounced among individuals with comorbid personality disorder. Patients without personality disorder do not show significant adv advancement in long-term group analytic therapy. Short-term group analytic therapy transformed into fo focus group analytic therapy. It's a revised and expanded version of uh, the approach described in the original manual and integrate the clinical and research evidence that result from the studies mentioned above and the own approach described in the manual. The main idea is that limited time requires focus on the patient's central issue and disturb interpersonal relationship. The question of how, is, uh, how much research we need evokes different answers. Lawrence is clear in contemporary challenges for research in group analysis, stating we need to more research. Nitsun follows a similar line in his article, Group Analytic Therapy on the Edge, mentioning new theoretical development in group analysis has bypassed some of the most urgent issues in the clinical application of the method. First, the real problems of running group, and then in the end, he said, and the need for greater empirical research and outcome evaluation. Furthermore, he believes that research in group analysis is only in its infancy and holds significant potential. But in the harmony of these, uh, of these two voices, completely opposing tones are also audible. In his article, Group Analysis in the Time of Austerity, Dalal is not only critical of research, but also believes that it could jeopardize the essence of group analytic therapy itself. He firmly expressed the stance, research that group analysis ought not to go down the route of the being tested and manualized, and it's the norm uh, in academic psychology today. And if it were, the product would not be the recognizable at group analysis. Practitioners wouldn't have to learn to be psychotherapists anymore. They would just need to follow the manual according to him. For Dalal, group analysis is more than just therapy. It's inherently subversive and embodied both ethical and political dimension. In his last, uh, latest book, uh, The Cognitive Behavioral Tsunami, uh, he offers in-depth critique of cognitive behavioral th therapy pinpointing in tendency toward hyper-rationality. 
He sheds light on the idea he labels as cognitive illusion, emphasizing the mistaken belief that humans are primarily cognitive be beings. He also delves into the topic of the overproduction of publication in cognitive behavioral therapy, highlighting an instance where a single study um, gave rise to 25 distinct publications. He suggests that the core issue is not with the therapy itself, it's then the overarching hype and how it's often presented and applied are matters of concern. Maurice Nitzen's perspective sharply contrasts with uh, that of Farhar Dalal again. In his book, Beyond the Anti-Group, Survival, Survival and Transformation, needs to dedicate a whole chapter to group analysis and cognitive behavioral therapy. He argues that the theory behind group analysis is both underdeveloped and lacks theoretical coherence. Highlighting the potential intersection of the two methodologies, Nitsu shares his experience supervising group CBT session. In this session, CBT therapists were expo uh, exposed to and educated on the group processes, a topic which they were previously unfamiliar, offering them a deeper understanding of group dynamics. Mitsun believes that such exchanges can provide valuable insights and add uh, uh, in establishing a more robust theoretical foundation for group analysis. The question arises as how two training analysts from the same school can hold such divergent opinion. Does this discrepancy highlight the looseness of group analytic theory, which seems to accommodate entirely different principles? Furthermore, it's compelling to know how CBT, a modality centered on altering thoughts and behaviors, and one that doesn't engage with transfers and counter-transfers, will align with the theoretical coherence of group analysis that needs on advocates for. Not only do disagreements exist of matters of research and their stance towards CBT, which is deemed of lesser importance, but there is also diver divergence concerning a key concept of group analytic theories, such as the social unconscious, which finally introduced some coherence into the theory. The theory of group analysis has established itself as a nexus between sociology and contemporary psychoanalysis. Additionally, the notion of social unconscious has evolved to become an integral component of foundational theory of group analysis. Dalal is firm about the definition of social unconsciousness that is devoid of any influence from individual psychology. He passionately advocates for the language of group analysis to be free from the influence of individual psychoanalytic viewpoints. He even expressed reservation about Hopper's delineation of social unconscious, suggesting that Hopper's interpretation is seem rooted in individual psychoanalytic concepts which only later accommodate the social dimensions. The weaker version aligns with the orthodox view of Fuchs, where the individual exists first and the unconscious subsequently enters. In this view, the social is poured into the individual as into the vessel. Conversely, the stronger idea proposed that the social unconscious essentially is this unconscious vessel, vessel, implying that our unconsciousness is fully shaped by the social. Accordingly to this perspective, the social unconscious is not just an element of psyche, but its very structure, its container, or even its fundamental framework. Dalal criticized Fuchs for not fully abandoning orthodoxy and Freud to embrace Elias radical view. On the other hand, Nitsun louds Fuchs for this very approach. According to Nitsun, Fuchs' ability to merge both perspectives is a strength rather than a weakness. The reason is that Fuchs is primarily a clinician, and in clinical practice, he said it's currently impossible to work solely for a social perspective. Nitsun has expressed reservation about the clinical application of social unconscious concept. He feels there's an overemphasis of labeling it uh, as the hallmark of contemporary group analysis and as a legacy to future generation. He also stated that the notion that the individual is an abstraction has become a fixture, almost a sacred tenet in the culture of group analysis. Yet, from a clinical standpoint, our primary duty is to the individual. He stated that we bear responsibility for individual patient well-being and answer to them. The history of group analysis is characterized as a complex, confabulatory, conflictual, and conglomerate with theoretical framework being labeled as a broad church. The intricacy of group therapy can be challenging. Even though its literature is rich, it can also be puzzling. Several, several authors argue for the need for more distinct and clear and concept, concept clarity. Looking ahead, Nitsun stressed the importance of being ready to explain to potential client in the future how group analysis function and its efficacy while providing practitioners and educants with an understanding of the foundational theories upon which it stands. 
Is it possible that the extreme proponents of social orientation have not worked, as, as Nitsu said, in, with challenging patients in public services and lack sufficient experience to recognize the necessity of individual approach? Or Nitsu did not utilize Mate Blanco telemicroscope and observed fluid unity instead of dichotomy and realized the individual as just one level of group? My second part is the social neuroscience of intergroup relations. It's a newer discipline. The integration with neuroscience is not universally accepted. In his work, The Future of Psychoanalysis, Richard Chesik argues that psychoanalysis is Uh, fundamentally hermeneutic and he envisioned its future in a deeper connection with social science rather than neurobiology. The neuroscience of intergroup relation is a rapidly advancing field with numerous studies focusing on areas such as neuroscience of intergroup violence, the neuroscience behind the ideological bias and extre extremist behavior, and sociocultural neuroscience perspective. There is a new book, Molenberg is editor, and uh, Ivan Urlich is uh, right uh, preface, I think. How much this can de deepen the understanding of group analysis remains to be seen, but let us remember Fuchs' words, taking for granted that a future psychoanalyst needed to experience in neurology. I'll provide an example of serious neuroscientific study that uses neuroimaging and an example of theoretical connection between group analytic and neuroscientific knowledge. Recent converging neuroimaging research has shown that pro-social behavior is associated with three brain networks. The first is responsible for first scan rewards, is dopaminergic pathway center in the striatum. The second link to the emotional salience network and empathy network. And the third is a self-control and mentalizing network involving in prefrontal cortex. Molenberg's all performed fMRI study where participants could give reward money or inflict punishment, electroshock, on either in-group or out-group members. This study revealed that uh, favoring an in-group member feel more rewarding than favoring an out-group member. Two fMRI, fMRI studies show distinct patterns for in-group and out-group member pro-social behavior. Pro-social behavior towards in-group members activates the striatum, the reward center, explaining its automatic nature and its self-rewarding. Assisting out-group members activates the mentalizing network and it requires more effort. Isn't this further evidence of our deep-seated emotional need to belong? People need to favor the group they belong in order to feel good about themselves. One of the reasons for creating an us is the need for a group to belong to uh, one that we can nurture so that in return it nurtures us. The group is idealized so that we can delight in the reflection of this glory. The founder of effective neuroscience, Jak Panksepp, demonstrates through cross-species effective neuroscience that seven basic emotional circuits, seeking, fear, anger, lust, care, panic and play, are biologically hardware into the brain minds of all humans and mammals, even birds. These seven universal emotional motivational circuits are ancient transmitters and receivers we all possess, enabling us to recognize emotion in ourselves and in others. Each emotional neuro circuit is associated with specific cues, such as motor signs, vocalization, facial expression, cadence of breath, blink rhythms, pill erections, sweating, blushing, tail wagging, which could form the neural basis of foundation matrix. This exemplifies the deep connections not only within hu humanity but also bridges us to other species. Burut stated that the circuit could constitute a substrate for the foundation matrix represented our collective experience as a species, including unconscious aspect. Claire Basha on the same path is on the same path in her work, Neuroscience and the Social Unconscious. I am in the end. Numerous work by Alan Shore have demonstrated that interbrain synchronization occurs through the connection of right hemisphere in individual. The central node of this connection is the right temporal parietal junction, which represents the crucial point of social brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so, from the works of Ander Koch, we understand that trauma leads to hyperactivation of the right brain and the right amygdala, while the left prefrontal cortex becomes in in inactive. We lack words for emotion, overwhelmed by internal sensation, and due to the thalamic blockage acting as a filter, we became sensitive to every stimulus. This is just my speculation, but could this happen in a large group? With so many active right brains, there is a great opportunity for communication and connection, but due to their strong activation, they simultaneously block the left brain, preventing us from finding words. 
We are flooded with sensation, both internally and externally, similar to experimental PTSD. And we may withdraw into dissociation when it becomes too overwhelming, silently suffering even when others are present. Eventually, this can be overcome by the effort of connected with others. To advocate for the group analytic approach in the future, we must emphasize both the benefits and the objective effectiveness of thinking together. Elias provides insight into this, pointing out that thinking did not evolve in isolation. It began with the collective activity of hunting. Speech then emerged to enhance this activity, followed by the advent of thought. This progression illuminates the social nature of thinking, which originates with groups and its collective possession. Thank you. Thank you, Danilo. And now, since it was designed in that way, we will go straight to Snežana's lecture. Snežana Kecović Miljević is also a psychiatrist and a group a training group analyst, and uh, somebody who is very much devoted to all these fields, and also a poet. So I give you words. <laughs> Dear colleagues, I'm very glad that I am here in front of us together with my two colleagues, Yelitsa and Danilo, and to have opportunity to share with you uh, some thoughts about uh, the future of the past and how past uh, connected with group analysis is present now and here. Also, uh, I will deal with the issue of malignant process of otherization and its role in the destruction of diversity among the group of our compatriots who live on Kosovo Metohija and also who have migrated from Kosovo Metohija to Serbia. In an interview that Malcolm Pines gave authors Jennifer Stein and Samuel Stein in the book Psychotherapy in Practice, Life in Mind, when asked about psychoanalysis and psychotherapy in low-income and less developed countries. Pine said, but it's tragic actually because we did a lot of work in Yugoslavia before the fighting broke out. It is frightening to see how the savagery completely breaks out and overwhelms people who are colleagues, even people who are working at that sort of high level of humanity. This is easily broken and lost. And he adds, I often have problems with the idea of psychoanalysis beginning to practice in primitive or poorly developed countries and wondering how in tune they are to the people's needs, but they are probably important in getting at least something going. Pines disillusioned tone and belief that the brutality of the wars in this region in the 90s jeopardize the uh, fledging group analysis and rip the ties between colleagues can be viewed today as an echo of events chronologically close to the time of the interview. The future of this past moment at this point in time disproves the pessimistic outlook of Pines concerned attitude. Group analysis survived, grows and flourishes, now entering the post-adolescence period of young adulthood in Serbia, but also in Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina and Slovenia. Are group analysis a weak and insufficient cure when people are confronted with massive ca uh, calamities like the ones we are facing today between Russia and Ukraine? Is it like offering cake to hungry people? Or is that group analysis do have a lot of offer to those who encourage diversity even when they are under pressure and torn by problems of preserving their tent canvas? Isidora Sekulic, the greatest Serbian female writer and the first woman to become a member of the Serbian Academy of Science and Arts, in one of her last public address to the young people of former Yugoslavia, recorded by Radio Belgrade back in 1958, said, 
The distances are overcome, everything is closed and within reach. Therefore, the question of com community is a serious issue. issue. Man threatens fellow man, power means dominance, and dominance means powerless of another. Scientific progress is uh, everywhere, but relations between people are reduced to share mistrust, contempt, and evil. Evil is on the rise and growing. Bombs are ready on all sides, yet we hear talk of zones of neutrality. Take on and bring for, for the idea of the zone of wisdom. Otherwise, neither peaceful coexistence nor peaceful coexistence will ever come about. Can group analysis create that very zone of wisdom? To what extent does group analysis help in solving the problems of the community? How much does this help an individual get better with the help of the group or group with the help of the another group? Even though we know that it cannot make the world get better. What is getting better if it is not getting well altogether? Group analysis was created as therapeutic method, and yet we see a shift in the medical discourse, categorical diagnostic system of health versus illness towards the dimensional, which uh, relativizes clear dichotomy between health and illness. The medical language is also changing. The absence of illness is no longer a sign of health nor is the impeded function always a sign of illness, at least for most people that are seeking for, psycho for psychotherapy today. I can relate to Dalal when he says that uh, group psychotherapy only has the potential to release one form of the entrapment of one and only discourse of one and only experience of self and the world. There is no absolute health here, only flexibility as an instance of health. It seems that the capacity for flexibility is inversely proportioned to the capacity for evil. And what is evil? Author Roger Kennedy, in a very new, valuable book for this subject, The Evil Imagination, speaks about spectrum of evil that includes a wide range of extreme forms of uh, intentional harm to others with um, uh, ensuring suffering and psychological damage, including the indifference towards suffering. The spectrum of evil includes attempt at annihilation of the subject, destruction of human life, as well as an erosion of intersubjective relationship. Evil not only destroys the subjectivity of the victim, but also provokes a transformation in the subjectivity of the perpetrator who loses the capacity for empathy with others. The consequence of this erosion is that uh, otherness becomes a source of prejudice, and in extreme cases, social and or physical death. Evil seeks to destroy the intersubjectivity to using the terminology of philosopher Martin Buber to turn the I too into I eat relationship. Unfortunately, human history is full of such examples. Terrifying examples of arising the subjectivity of the uh, other can be found in a story of the Yellow House, never corroborated, but also never utterly refuted. A house located in North Albania where the captives mostly kidnapped Serbs from Kosovo during the 99 were served as unwilling donors in a criminal sale of the, their organs. In a story by a Serbian writer and journalist, Bojan Tončić, Shallow Depth, Dedicated to deserters, to the true heroes of the Balkan Wars, as he calls them, he speaks of, according to him, the most important article post-October 5th revolution in Serbian press by a courageous female journalist based on the precise official list of objects excavated from one of the mass graves in Batajnica near Belgrade. Scarves, wallets, marbles, pacifiers, peel blister packs. These common objects become monstrous artifacts of the killed, buried, dig up, and then frozen bodies of Kosovo Albanians that were then transported to mass grave. I remember a book which was a mandatory school reading for Serbian pupils in, uh, in uh, lessons in Albanian language in the school I attend in Pristina by one of the greatest Albanian authors, Ismail Kadare, the general of the Dead Army. It was written back in 1963 as a deep anti-war drama about an Italian general traveling to Albanian mountain ranges, searching for the 
reminds of the, his countrymen, soldiers who had died during World War II. The people there, also aware of the pain and tragedy that the General's Army accused them, get over the tragic past with dignity and help the General find the bodies buried on enemy territory. Today, almost prophetically, but also topically, Kadare's story tells of possibility of forgiveness, grieving and mourning for the families of Kosovo Serbs and Albanians that vanished in the last war. One of the most tragic lessons from recent Serbian history about how evil manipulates and occupies human minds was Slobodan Milosevic's public speech at Gazi Mestan in 1989 in honor of the 600th anniversary for the Battle of Kosovo. That was spark that ignited Balkan powder keg, putting in motion the lady ready and waiting ideological nationalistic massification throughout, for, throughout former Yugoslavia. The manipulation with the use of the most uh, precious ethnic, cultural, and historical values of the Balkan peoples misused and resurrected Kosovo myth and one hand, and breaking the cycle of blood revenge with forgiveness and reconciliation between Kosovo and Albanian families on the other. Those were the ways of creating armies. Both the Kosovo Serbs and Albanians scammed to it occupied by dangerous and destructive political and ideological manipulation with their own history, tradition, ethnic and cultural values that many of which they shared for centuries. All of a sudden, Kosovo and Metohija become a space where there is no room for other, nor had there been a counterbalance vision other, other than an intense process of otherization, which Kathleen Tyler defines as creating a social gap between us and them. The road to Auschwitz was paved with indifference, said Jan Kershaw. Evil was unfolding, and many of us were just silent passive observers in the war scenario. This is a probably why the arrival of the first generation of educated group analysts from Belgrade to Kosovo and Metohija in early 19s seemed like offering cake to the hungry, as well as the attempt to explore possibilities for dialogue for the survival of the coexistence of Kosovo Serbs and Albanians. Or was it just an attempt to create an impression of getting at least something going? To some of us in Kosovo and Metohija back then, this breath of, of unrealistic optimism meant a lot, for it, uh, for it was a small window into that zone of wisdom. Two dec decades later, the local reflective citizens dedicated one moment themselves to empowering the remaining uh, Serbs in Kosovo and Metohija, but there was no possibility for dialogue with the significant others, Albanians. Dalal view of identity through the concept of inner group and relational phenomenon I find important for the following question, one of identity, ethnic identity, and, and ethnicity. The plurality of human belonging is a reality and belonging is the thing that uh, immediately leads to identity. The plur plurality of identity is the reason for its potential richness, but also fragility. There is a constant danger of slipping from one identity to another, of one kind of us to mutate to another kind of us. An ethnic group is formed by members based on their subje subjective sense of belonging. But speaking in terms of the radical focus, the subjective sense of belonging is actually formed from their inner group in an individual, and as such, the ethnic identity is also a phenomenon embedded in the network of social interactions. Ethnicity is a component of identity, and it's complex due to its fluidity, flexibility, dependence on context, and possibility to be manipulated with. And like all ethnic phenomena, uh, it often carries a strong emotional char charge and irrationality. Modern uh, ethnicity theorists are moving to focus uh, the focus of their research from culture to studying boundaries and social interactions. A group is not defined by, by cultural characteristic, language, or religion being different from another, but the process of interaction and communication lead to a need for symbolic separation that make the difference possible and visible. In that way, ethnicity becomes a question of relations, 
relation, relation phenomena, not a statistic trait of a group. It ensues from contact, not from isolation. For the needs of this part of paper, I use the research of ethnologist Sanja Zlatanovic, which dealt with the question of ethnic identification of Serbian community in southeastern Kosovo in the post-war period and may pers my personal experience of repeated stays in Kosovo and Metohija enclaves. I will try to place this group analytic viewpoint in the ethnologic background of th this community. The ethnicity of Kosovo Serbs mostly uh, native to those parts that are still living in Kosovo and Metohija uh, stems from a historically very deep and strong habitus, a second nature, according to Elias, whose multiple layers result from intergroup relations uh, with a number of significant others, Kosovo set settler Serbs, Kosovo Croatians, Kosovo Albanians, Kosovo Turks, Romanians. In the same, before mentioned interview, Malcolm Pines shares his opinion that everyone should know more than one language, a social, intellectual, professional language. He refers to a Russian author, Bakhtin, who wrote about monoglossia and heteroglossia. Monoglossia is when one dialect attempts to present itself as only language, like the language of, or, or Marx, of Marxism at that time. But true language is always heteroglossia, and it is constant inner dialogue or dialectic between different languages. This opinion of Pines mirrors the lady mentioned theory of plural identity and polyphony of of the inner group. The dialect the uh, the, the of Kosovo Serbs, due to centuries of relation with significant others, has a polyphony of narration, heteroglossia, and dialect is of inner diversity of voices. Language is considered one of the most important aspects of ethnicity. Prizren South Morava dialect is far remote from the Serbian standard language, and so diglossia is reality for Kosovo Serbs, but also for Kosovo Albanians whose dialect is different from the standardized form of Albanian language. Due to this marked diglossia, the Kosovo Serbs are often viewed by their countrymen in Serbia as non-pure Serbs, similar to Albanians, and thus exposed to stigmatization. The linguistic diglossia is one of the basic elements setting up the boundary between us and them by the Serbs living in Serbia proper who are preaching for uh, impermeable borders, uh, equating language uh, and nation and promoting the process of modernization, even toward their uh, compatriots, people from Serbia proper put their country, countrymen from Kosovo to the farthest end of otherness, also due to the so-called chain of oriental, uh, oriental, orientalization of another. The tendency of people from Balkan to present their neighbors as more oriental and thus more primitive and conservative. The life of Kosovo Serbs in the post-war territory has been shaken to the core in the past two and a half decades, in a word, a ghetto-like life in the enclaves. The everyday life in Kosovo uh, enclaves could be best described using the words of Ivana Marček describe li describing life in Sarajevo du during the four-year four siege, an imitation of normal life, or by words, waiting room or and labyrinth. The chronotope of labyrinth with no way in or out where they are, where they are trapped describes the inner and outer reality of Kosovo Serbs and the ghetto-like uh, enclave mentality for the, their community. An enclave from Latin enclavio, clavitus, locked in, in a political geographic sense is a small area of country surrounded on all sides by territory of another state. The very definition of the uh, word shows how inadequate that term is and how deeply insulting for territory in which Kosovo Serbs live since according to the Unit Nation Resolution uh, 1244, Kosovo is still part of Serbia. Older people often share the view of uh, men I talked to in the village in Vrbovac. 
When his Albanian acquaintance meet him and ask him surprised how come he hasn't yet moved to Serbia, insulted, he, the man answered that even if he, Albanian, were to make a davul, a musical instrument from his skin, and start beating on it for Ramadan, he would still even skin stay in Kosovo. Kosovo is Serbia, quote, Kosovo is Serbian, even if there were no Serbs in it, it is an inseparable part of us. It is, I don't know, as if somebody took a part of your body and cut it uh, off just like that. Uh, some analysts uh, describe the mental image of a state as a figure of nurturing mother. A mental image of a nation is more than an image of community of people because you have to imagine place to body, homeland. The inhabitants of a nation state may have personally visited only a small part of their nation territory, but their attitude towards that territory do not depend on their personal contact to the physical space. A national identity is somehow an unconscious category. In Kosovo and Metohija, there is an extensive process of cancelling out the other and an intensive process of hegemonization and strengthening of ethnic identity of Kosovo Albanians by the new winners. This intense process of otherization also leads to uh, social death of Kosovo Serbs. The political centers of power from both sides try to direct the complex identification of Kosovo Serbs and Kosovo Albanians towards clear-cut forms to eliminate everything that is the result of a mixing and hybridization that they view as contamination. The post-war Kosovo, Kosovo is, I would say, a picture of betrayed hopes of both parties. Uh, peace in Kosovo should have only future, even thought in the north and in the south, the use of two words for it, the sound uh, completely, they, they, they sound completely differently. Budućnost and arme, says Peter Henke. It is hard to describe the position of Kosovo Serbs in Kosovo in Serbia in a word. They are their own among aliens and alien among their own. Uh, yeah, I will skip the example. Uh, and club like mentality in clinical practice. I set up a very small analytic group of four female members in the form of block scheduling for groups in two days every first weekend in a month. The in row. Uh, the reason behind such a block setting was the fact that there was one group member highly motivated to the therapy and education who was not from Belgrade and who. Uh, could not travel every week to attend the group meetings. That year, organizing the group in a hybrid form was uh, unimaginable for me. It is the first, uh, in the first two months, the group lost one member, then gained a new female member, and not long after, a first male member. The man quickly adopted the role of monopolist, domineering the group, and was exposed to very harsh attacks by the United Woman. After a couple of months, he left the group, leaving the female members with a great sense of relief, and me with a substantial substan depth. In the second year of the life of the group, one member decides to leave the group dissatisfied with the block schedule form. She asked for sessions to take place once a week, which was not possible for that group, so she stops coming therapy altogether. After this dropout, highly regular attendance ensues. I was intensively overcome by contrastive feelings of helplessness and anger toward the group. During the session, the members deal with everyday matters superficially, chatter cheerfully, and I have an impression that I'm leading a monthly clubbing and not a therapy group. Intimacy issues are widely avoided. I was struggling to find a patient who would agree to block schedule therapy. At the end of the group's third year of life, just before the summer break, a member asked for an individual session when announced that she is desperate because of a sudden break with her partner of two years. Her partner is the former group member that left the group after she insisted we change the block schedule to weekly session. They knew each other before entering into group therapy, but they started dating after one of them left the group. That was new for me. Only 
Then, after three years of therapy, I found out that I formed a group with members out of which two were laid in a, in a relationship. An image of an anti-group Trojan horse that came to my mind was strong, and so was a mixture of anger and feeling cheated. Going back for a moment to my emotional state when that group member insisted uh, for us to go back for a from a block uh, schedule to weekly session, I could remember a particular personal feeling of restraint to switch to, uh, to weekly regime. I could only describe it's a feeling that both the group and I were being held hostage, locked in form of the outside within the e imposed block schedule, and that, uh, that uh, quality of being locked in which was serving the needs of one member led to a specific group situation, a group with a small number of members, completely gender homogenized, with the growing anxiety that it will disintegrate due to, to irregular attendance and irregular attendance because of the feel of insecurity, the feeling of being locked in form, the outside and closed off to admittance of new members, especially those that would disturb the homogeneity of the group. Men, I mean others, fear of new dropouts, which would mean disintegration of the group. In the group matrix, there was a secret of two members being a couple. The group, group was suffocating in the uh, enclave mentality, the atmosphere of labyrinth and passive expectation that salvation will come from the outside, from a, a messian born out of the coupling. The sudden outbreak of COVID-19 and switching the online sessions once uh, a week liberated the group. A male member was introduced and he stayed on, and the group continued to operate in a much more productive and free way. Discovering and clava like mentality in small therapy groups as a social psychological retreat, I consider an echo of deeply unconscious processes born in the part of the foundation matrix that could be called the national unconscious due to outer social circumstances circumstances and whose echo can resound in every therapy group and each and every one of us. I will stop here. Thank you to all three of you and uh, uh, Snezhen, especially for this last example of enclave and mentality, how this like a labyrinth. So we have little time, but I ask you for some questions. I would like to, uh, I would like to thank, I can speak without the microphone, thank you. Okay, I would like to, to thank all three of you and, uh, and I can hardly find words, but uh, Yalitza, thank you for this wide camera that I followed into realizing the, the, the small. And Danila, thank you for teaching me something new. And uh, well, the, the last I can hardly talk, but uh, I would like to, I thank you for your courage, and I would like to more of these in the future. Thank you so very much. I, I'd like to echo what Sanya just said about the, <clears throat> the, the, the last presentation, because I think it was an impressively courageous attempt to address the political dynamics and problematics of Kosovo. Um, and it's very much appreciated. But I think it's handicapped by a non-dialectical model <clears throat> because you're trying to address dialectical historical processes with a model that is insistently non-dialectic because it has shed the roots that Fuchs had with the Frankfurt Institute and with that whole dialectical way of thinking. <clears throat> and I feel that in a sense there's a that's a contradiction in the way that the 
the situation in Kosovo is, is, is approached from, from a traditional group analytic point of view. And I think there were contradictions in the earlier papers as well, because as I read Derrida, the essence of Derrida is to subvert, to challenge the traditional discourse, to challenge its roots in the hegemony of European and Western intellectual thought. And yet in the presentation, it's incorporated seamlessly into a positivist discourse that is rooted in those very traditions that Derrida is so critical of, which seems to me very contradictory. And I think in the second paper, there was a, the mention of the term um, ideological bias. But the paper repeatedly quotes Dalau, who as I read him has said very clearly, there is nothing beyond ideology. There is no alternative to having an ideological position. And yet the term ideological bias implies that there is something else. There's some other kind of objective view that is not biased by ideology. So again, there's a contradiction in the way that, that Dalal's work is, is read because he doesn't seem to be really understood in its, in its consistency, in its entirety. And the basis of his critique of, um, of CBT and that, that whole research paradigm is I understand it, is that it is in, in, inevitably an embodiment of an ideology in the way that Foucault understood the relation of knowledge and power, and not that it is ideological and ideologically biased away from some um, objective norm. This is indeed so very full and so very rich and so very complicated, these three presentations. And I can only admire it and admire the effort. My comment now is especially on the research the presentation. I'm a group researcher and I want to mention a perspective on research which you didn't bring in. I don't think you would be against it, but it didn't happen. I bring it in. It is instead of the dominating trend in psychotherapy research of effect and the result. I grew more and more interested in what happens on the, in the journey between the start and the end. What happens to the train, so to say, in different stations along its road. I got interested in process studies. I got interested to use a magnifying glass and going into the group when the group is working as a group and what happens then, and rather amazing and very complicated results happen when I used a method which I and people who worked with me also constructed the matrix representation grid. It's complicated, it's expensive and whatever, and I won't go into it now, it doesn't, there is no time for that. In case I'm alive and you want me to come back and give a seminar on it, okay, I'll be happy to do that. But the interest is especially um, what happens from uh, one sentence to another sentence, one group theme to another group theme, one group climate to another group climate, if one wants to use the group for definite purposes, for instance, treatment, or maybe in other instances, other groups for other purposes. But the idea that it's worthwhile to look upon the process as such, however complicated, it is worthwhile to doing it and rather amazing things happen when we look upon it. So, Th sorry, thank you for the question. Uh, now I would like to see if there are some uh, questions from online or comments. Put the, the process research. I will put the process research uh, and the conceptual research and that microanalytic research in a paper. So it will be in a paper. 
because there is no time now. I miss to say that all three of lecturers told that this is shorter version of their work. Yes. Isaura, let me give you a word. Thank you. Are you hearing me? Yes. So thank you all of the three, but mainly Danilo. It's, I think it's quite, thank you for highlighting controversies within group analysis. It's the future, we have to discuss them and to look at them, not, uh, uh, and not as a fight, but as a, perhaps as a fight, it's absolutely fundamental to look at controversies and to the links to neurosciences. Thank you all, especially the new. Uh, oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you so much. I, I really appreciate all the work that's gone into those. I was just writing and writing. Um, I've noticed a theme which is about absence, or what I call a perturbation. John mentioned what's missing, what's not being said. And it's a really useful indicator of lots of several things at once. Absence is an indicator of trauma due to dissociation. The absence of people after a war is obvious. The absence of what can be said in a group is evidence of possibly an abuse of power by the conductor or members of the group. And also the physical impingements on people who can't enter the group, their absence because of economic restrictions and also group taboos and cultural taboos that there are certain things can't be spoken about. So that very simple question, what's missing? What's the perturbation? I wondered if you had any thoughts about that in your discoveries, whether that has an echo for you in your work, whether you've noticed the gaps and what, may, what sense you've made of them. Do you want to say something? I have only one association uh, of, on, your, on, your, on your questions. It is enclave like psychology in my group. We was captured in enclave. That was the feeling of the people who are in enclave. Powerless, somebody else outside of the door making decisions in his, their names without possibility to go out and to stay there, uh, going around in a circle in the labyrinth without life. Hi, I think. Thank you to all three of you for illuminating presentations. <clears throat> when I wrote out my keynote, I said I was honored to be able to bring material here, but I looked forward to what I could learn. I feel I've come here for a purpose to learn, and today this purpose has been really fulfilled. I'd like to comment briefly on each of the three presentations. In the first, there is a grasp of the philosophical grounding of group analysis and its sociological imagination that I've not read before with such fluency. And I look forward to reading the paper quietly and corresponding and seeing these ideas extended and developed. The second is somewhere outside my own field of competency because I don't work with uh, research methods or tools. In regard to the third, the courage to take a group analytic model and make it work in a form almost like social anthropology in a field of conflict and duress is inspiring. And I hope we'll hear more from you about this. 
but I want to raise what is now perhaps one of our last such opportunities, and it is a very uncomfortable question. I mentioned in my own keynote that my name is unusual because very few of us survived in Lithuania with this name during the Nazi occupation. Currently, the Lithuanian government is making significant and important efforts to reach out towards the tiny Jewish population that remains in Lithuania and towards the many descendants of Lithuania's Jews living in other countries. And I regard it as an honor and a duty to respond to their call. It's a call for reparation. What I'd like to know from you people here is what scope is there for active forms of reparation? It seemed to me when I tried to understand what was happening during the terrible days of the Srebrenica massacre, that there seemed to be a direct line in historical determinism from the killings of Serbs and Jews at Jasenovac to the killing of Bosnians in Srebrenica. I don't understand these interconnections and I don't understand how you make sense of the history you've lived through. But it is, I regard it as a privilege to come here and to see you struggling with this history. And we'd like to be able to work with you to unpack these determining forces. Thank you. Would you like to comment or John spoke about transgenerational trauma that is transmitted and actually uh, maybe I'm not as a chair to, to give an answer but uh, just to comment that uh, this uh, I think was really a big part uh, in war that, that happened in 90s because unmourned uh, lost people, that some, it was mentioned, uh, were source of unworked through feelings and maybe a good base for propaganda and fear that this will be repeated again. So I believe that, that among other things, this, this was something uh, important. I don't know about you. Of course, uh, the transgenerational trauma, but not only from Srebrenica and from uh, Yasinovac. Yasinovac, but many, many uh, uh, centuries, many, many, and centuries ago, and uh, many years ago, and uh, a lot of history of. Uh, uh, people in this, in Balkan, is connected with uh, wars and with traumatizing and with uh, transgenerational trauma. That's not only three generations. But of course, it is a question how can it stop? Is it stopped now? You know, we have time or we are oh, over time? We, we passed over time. So thank you very much to presenters and y'all for the